I'm going to talk about climate change and social resilience here. And as an anthropologist, of course, my main concern is with people. But with the people that I worked with, the landscape sort of presses, presses itself onto your mind and there's no way of getting round the ice without mentioning it. So what I'm going to do here is to show you some pictures from the field where I worked intermittently over the past 10 years or even a little more about life in northwest Greenland. The people living there are descendants of a small group of people that were actually first discovered in 1818 by an, a British sailor called John Ross who met them. And this is actually a drawing, a watercolor drawing, of this first encounter between the British explorers and the little tribe of people that they met with. At the time, they were down to maybe only 150 people, but they had lived there without contact with other people for about 300 years, as far as we can uh, tell, because they'd been hemmed in by the ice over what was called the Little Ice Age. But here, their isolation was finally broken and they remained in contact with the rest of the world ever since then. The next in line to report seriously on the condition of this little group was Knud Rasmussen, who visited the place first in 1902 to 1904, and he documented their tales and traditions, and he decided he would return back to these people, make a trade station, and, and to sort of make their lives, make their supplies of foreign goods much more regular than they'd been so far. So he established a trade station there in 1910. Before that, he documented them. And this is the Thule people, how they looked in 1909. And they are actually pictured at the place where the trade station was later established. And you can see they are all clad in skin dresses like they were in 1818 and like they still are. Today, of course, these people live, live modern lives. They're part of the modern world for better and for worse. And they are connected to the outer world in lots of ways. Geographically, they are isolated, but since 2001 or two, they have had a regular weekly flight out of the region, weather permitting. And since the, over the past 10 years, they have had access to the internet. So they feel connected and they are connected to the sort of general knowledge base of the earth. But still, there are very few of them and they are geographically isolated and they're very much stuck during most of the year where they live. This is a picture of Kranach, the main town, but apart from that, there are some smaller settlements and this picture that I show you here is an example. It's a small place called Rikadat, which is at the bottom of a vast fjord and um, there are only about 14 or 15 permanent inhabitants left. But during summer, the summer now will hunt in the fjord. There'll be more people using the old houses as hunting abodes. But what is happening is that the connection between the settlements are being uh, hampered by the sort of breakup of the ice earlier than before and the, the uncertainty of the ice for larger periods. Until recently, and still actually, I mean, the ice serves as basic infrastructure in the entire region. And you can see on this picture, you can see two, two sledges meeting uh, on the ice. And every time you meet another sledge going somewhere, you stop, you have tea, and you exchange news from the various points from where they derive. Are there game in this direction? Are there seals here? What about the open water? And so they exchange news as a matter of course. And my way of studying these people is not so much looking at them as going along with them. This uh, picture you can see here is, is sort of shown to illustrate the fact that, that uh, the ice is the basic infrastructure of movement in, in uh, Kranach. Of course, you have your dog sledges, but dog sledges and dogs, they need the ice to move forward. So the ice is what has connected people and settlements with each other and with their hunting grounds. And the dogs know where they go and they're very reliable partners in the hunting uh, of big game in the region. And, and this picture also uh, is going, go, 
goes to show how whenever sledges are crossing on the ice or meeting, people will stop and exchange news about the game further ahead or, or open ice, open waters in, in particular directions. So people change, exchange information about the hunting condition and not least the ice conditions when they meet. Um, I'll show you this map here because it's you know this is a map of the Tula region. You have that uh, to the right, and uh, you can see the names of small villages. But what you can also see, and what is important in this, is the North Water. The uh, uh, the uh, and I'll, I'll have to point to it. This here, this is the North Water, and that is what is called an Arctic oasis, meaning that there is a patch of open water all year round, or if not entirely open, then at least with a very thin layer of ice. And that has made life possible in that region for ages, really, both animal life and human life. And the first uh, immigrations to Greenland took place across from Ellesmere Island in northeast Canada and into Northwest Greenland. And people were attracted by this open water where lots of marine mammals um, gathered together and could be found and hunted most of the year. Of course, it's easier in springtime than in, in winter because they have four months without, uh, solar, without sun. But anyway, what people do still do although it's increasingly fragile, is that they go to hunt game at the border of this north water. And there is this ice edge where they go for hunting marine mammals. And what you can see here is a hunting camp in which I participated. I've participated in several, but, but this is also, this was my first experience of going to a hunting camp. And you can see if you look at the uh, tents, they're actually erected on the sledges. So the sledges, they serve as a sleeping platform covered with reindeer hides, and then they raise these tents over them so they can sleep uh, during the night or whenever it's, it's light all uh, day at, at this particular time. And when you're lying there in the tent trying to sleep, you realize that the ice is moving up and down. There's a tide coming in and you can hear it cracking and you begin to understand how fragile this ice age is. Uh, it, 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 it still holds, but not always. Sometimes it does break off and people are carried out on their sledges on an ice floe and then they have to wait for the current going back again. But I've never experienced that. I've just heard about it in, in neighboring camps. But I was there and it was a fascinating, absolutely fascinating experience. And what happens when you are on the ice edge? I mean, people are hunting different kinds of game. And this, this is an instance of people dragging up a narwhal that they have caught, or well, a young man has just harpooned it and, and got it. But it takes a lot of people to drag it up. It, it's hundreds of kilo of meat that has to be dragged on, on, onto the ice and then cut up and shared among the participants. People, when they help dragging up, and collaboration is vital for everybody, so it's next time it's the other way around, they get a piece of the narwhal skin and the mattock, which is a delicacy in the region. And you can see again, there's this patch of open water and an ice edge that still holds where people can go. Along with the uh, ice, of course, and transport in general comes the, the dog sledge, which is a formidable instrument. And it's, it has been known in the region for the past thousand years, and it still serves its purpose. And it's still the ancient structure of wood that is sort of connected, not with hide scenes or uh, with, with animal uh, matter, but with nylon strings, but it has to be flexible. You cannot use um, nails because it would break apart. It has to be flexible because the ice is not even. And you can see here's a man, um, a hunter sort of packing his sledge and we are, we are going to go home here. So he's packing up and uh, you, we are sitting upon layers and layers of meat and and uh, and skins and and then comes the people uh, at the top. What this picture tells you is that old technologies are still indispensable for life in the region, at least as long as the ice lasts. 
what you can see here is um, a couple of men sort of cutting loose the uh, the narwhal tusk from the narwhal we saw dragged ashore uh, in an earlier picture. It is a major trophy, and it's also people can sell it for for money, and uh, it's so it's 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 a way of of earning real money. In earlier times, in earlier centuries, uh, actually back to the late Middle Ages, it was exported to European courts, and you can find them in European museums all over the place. And it was sold as the tusk of sea unicorns. Sea unicorns are narwhals, of course, and narwhals is a very rich resource of meat and blubber. And in the blubber, there's a lot of vitamins that people need for the long winter. So it's it's not just for fun that they hunt these uh, these big games. Sometimes, and of course, it has always happened, but it happens uh, sort of at, at different times now that the ice breaks up and the passage between different settlements or between the ice age and the uh, town of Kranach is broken by openings and cracks and uh, it becomes very very difficult to negotiate cracks like these and uh, in this particular case and I was with a hunter out there and we had to to cut loose or he had I was just a worried passenger but uh, he had to cut loose the dogs and see to their bringing them into to land and then he had to see to me and helping me sort of negotiating these cracks because after all there are about 800 meters of of open polar water just beneath you so you you cannot let yourselves yourself slip on these ice uh, flows here so it, it's a quite a frightening experience, but it was one that uh, made me realize how, how, challenge, how challenging life is and has always been in this region. It's not only the hunters who are implicated in, 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 in the sort of processing of, of uh, animal material, the women always worked very hard with the skins. Seal skins in particular turned into kamiks, but also in this particular case you see her musk ox, musk ox skins that are used for, for bed covers and, and uh, wool, the wool is uh, used for, for knitting, etc. So, but it has to be prepared in a very um, particular manner in order not to, to rot. And this uh, woman here is sort of cleansing the, the skin, taking off all the, the, the fat on the backside. <clears throat> she is, she's one of my friends. She's one of the persons that I've talked most with over the past 10 years when I visited the region. And what surprised me once, it shouldn't, but I mean, once she told me how she'd grown up further down the coast, and actually at one particular uh, expedition, I, I had the chance to visit the bay where she'd grown up, and this is the remnants of the Turf and Stone House where she grew up as a child in the 1930s uh, and, and, and 40s. And the leap between that time, she grew up with the, with the blubber uh, fire and, and with sort of making all things themselves. They had a bit of wood you can see from the Thule station, but otherwise it was Turf and Stone and only natural material. And, and you can see the, uh, the, the doorpost still stands. And I showed her this picture and she said she'd hoped that would be more left. There would be more left of her house. She hadn't been there for, I don't know, 40 years. But, but uh, still, this is what is left. What is also left is the trace of organic matter. The, the grass comes where people stays. There's all the fat and all the bones and things that they throw out from the houses and it gives uh, rise to, to, to grasses and organic matter, which in turn attracts other uh, animals like, I mean, on, on a larger scale, like hares and, and, and what have you. But the thing is that it's a very compressed history that they have lived from this time where people still have memories until today when they're living completely modern lives with all modern amenities and now over the past 10 years also with access to the internet. Now this is the same woman and, and she, she, ex she is uh, here being filmed by a film crew visiting 
uh, Kranach. And because she has such a good, good memory and, and, uh, and she l loves to speak to people who want to know her history. But my problem with, with most of these filming enterprises, that, and there have been so many over the past 10 years, is that the people are easily reduced to relics in a sense, as if they lived in the past tense. But they are very much living in the present with all of the challenges that this entails even though their history is very compressed. This picture shows that, I mean, it's not always covered with ice. This is the same fjord that we have visited before. And what you have here is a, is a man going out hunting for narwhal. And they're hunting narwhal by old rules making sure that they're not wasting the game. So they may hunt them only from, from kayaks, that is not motorboats, because motorboats would scare the pack away and prevent other people from getting another narwhal later. So they must make a silent hunt and they must make it, they must hit the, the whale first with the harpoon that is tied with a string to the um, to a floater and then to the kayak so that it's all silent and very sustainable. They won't waste any animals having been shot and, and then uh, disappearing into the dark seas. So here, and, and people should have an equal change. The next kayak should also have a change for having a share of the pack. And, and here they follow ancient rules of protection and, and, and they have proudly very recently and partly in, in uh, response to, to, to recent interests also from my research group, I work with biologists as well. They are now claimed in Greenland to have invented sort of species protection. And they're very proud of, of their old rules and they stick to them. And it's, it's, it's aesthetically so satisfying, but that's not why they're doing it. Of course, they also have motorboats, and, and in the in-between period, between, between the fast ice where they can move on, on sledges and the um, truly open water where they can use their kayaks, motorboats play an increasing role. It still has to negotiate ice flows and ice packs uh, in, in some seasons, but they're very much in use, and because their situation is so precarious in a sense. They can now get subsidies for bigger motorboats because this in-between in period between open water and fast ice is being is extending and they need motorboats if they should get uh, seals like these hunters here. You can see from the kayak that is tied to the boat that they had hoped for a narwhal. <laughs> but the narwhal, I mean, they, they have actually, they are leaving from the fjord at this time, but they had hopes, so they brought their kayak. And if they don't get a kayak, they can always take the seals that are on offer. They need them for dog feed and for the skins, of course. With the changing climate, it's not only the ice cover that changes, it's also the permafrost. The permafrost, which means, I mean, there is this permanent ice down that has served as as a bottom line of, 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 of houses, and houses are built on stilts that reaches down to the permafrost. It's like concrete in, in modern uh, buildings. But they are now sort of, now the, the permafrost is receding. The, the, the upper layer, is, is, which is volatile and wet, is going deeper. And you can see some of these houses are beginning to tilt and it's also noticeable. This is a relatively, it's a very small settlement in the southern part of the region called Savisivik, and, and, and it's, it's really being abandoned gradually because things are getting very harsh and they're disconnected from the rest of the, uh, the, the, the region. But, but it's an interesting place because people are trying to stick it out, mostly the men who want, because it's a very good place for hunting polar bears on the top of the Melville Bay. But other kinds of game are rare and the houses are tilting and things are getting very complicated because of the changing climate once again. So obviously the, the ice conditions and the changing conditions, both of the sea ice and the icebergs and the uh, permafrost makes people very uncertain about the future. But they are very resilient understood as being able to change 
uh, roots and to incorporate new things into their 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 lives if it's on offer. But I mean, somehow there's a limit also to resilience in this particular region. And um, the North Water itself is opening up rapidly and and the trouble there again is that it also opens up for Arctic cruises and industrial ships and to whatever that disturb the animals uh, immensely. So what's happening? The, a new resource in terms of tourists may actually endanger the old resources such as the marine mammals. So there's a lot to think about around the North Water that ha has kept these people alive and mighty for thousands of years. But I'm sure they'll find their ways. If you look at them, they're determined and they are above all things. They really love their place. They love their country. And if possible, they want to stay rather than move south in Greenland. So thank you very much.